Benue State Governor Samuel Autumn advocates a larger share of Nigeria's revenue to states. This comes at a time of shrinking federal earnings and growing debt. We'll be discussing Nigeria's federal education system this morning. Also coming up is a discussion on the latest global ranking of universities that places Nigeria's best institutions outside the top 1,000. How do we make our universities more competitive? And don't forget the regulars, Mike of the Press, and a look at the top trending stories of the day. Welcome to The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. Good morning. I am Aneta Felix. And I am Osaogi Ogmoa. Thanks for joining us and welcome to a Tuesday morning's edition of The Breakfast here on Plus TV Africa. Good morning once again. Okay, forget about the smile on my face. I am shocked as are many other Nigerians. <clears throat> and that's because of the news we've seen. Um, it's a United Nations report that um, exposed a secret program by the federal government for repentant Boko Haram members. We've been talking about repentant Boko Haram members for a while now and how they seem to be treated with kids' gloves. You know, but a United Nations report really has you know, just revealed how much of a, of a situation this is. So it says that as part of this program, um, former Boko Haram commanders are provided with rent-free accommodation. They're provided with um, monthly stipend by the SSS. They're given a business license for them to go on and you know, establish enterprises across the country. And something also shocking that I saw that the original plan of this is to de-radicalize them and reintegrate them into Nigeria's secret service. I really don't know how this comes across to you, but um, that's what we're hearing here, that this program is called MSULU program, and it dates back to 2014, when kids were abducted from um, the northern part of Nigeria, from Chibok, you know, and that um, when we know that 270 Chibok girls were abducted and even more, and, you know, 150 terrorists had allegedly surrendered. So these terrorists were basically part of the first search of the Suhu program aimed at de-radicalizing terrorists and integrating them into a secret, um, uh, Nigeria's secret security program. And, you know, the UN report went on to say that um, a total of 150 Muhajideen have surrendered their weapons and that they have crossed over from the Boko Haram terrorist side to the good side since 2019. And that's according to, you know, people who are familiar with the, with the program. And um, it also says that um, this program, you know, I, I mentioned the business license thing. It mentions the uh, monthly stipend that they would get. And the people, you know, that are participants of this program are commanders of Boko Ram or repentant commanders of Boko Ram that they had actually met with representatives of President Muhammad Buhari um, when they repented. So um, that really is what we're seeing. It's quite shocking to see this because we've seen news about people who are in internally displaced persons camps saying the federal government claims to have forgiven these bandits and terrorists, but we haven't. We are, you know, experiencing the hurt, the trauma of losing our family, of losing our loved ones, of being displaced, of, you know, not having a source of income anymore. This is where we are. This is what we have to make do with. But these people get... Um, rents free accommodation, they get monthly stipends. You know, I, I don't know really how this comes across to you, Osaragi. Um, uh, well, um, so, you know, the way that the story is told, you know, and from what you've described, it's not very different from, um, you know, it's pretty similar to the amnesty for uh, Niger Delta militants that was uh, approved by from President uh, Omar uh, Musayaradwa. Um, you know, some people might argue that it's not very different, but the, dif the, the only uh, difference here is the fact that the Nigerian government has not openly, you know, stated that that's what's going on. And the Nigerian people have also not agreed, you know, that there will be amnesty for uh, former terrorists and uh, Boko Haram members and commanders. It also defeats the argument that, you know, these are some of the people who were kidnapped and forced to join, um, you know, that uh, we had sometime last week, late last week, with one of the guests who we had interviewed. It defeats that argument because these are top commanders, according to the UN report, 
Um, they weren't forced to join in any way. They have carried out numerous atrocities, atrocities against the Nigerian state um, and all of that. So you can draw those similarities between this and the Niger Delta Amnesty Program. Um, I'm also going to say that you know there is also the possibility that the Nigerian government has decided to, instead of using you know force, you know to use the carrot and stick um, uh, approach, yeah? and that means that instead of continuing to bombard and to kill and you know do whatever is necessary and imprison, they would rather. Um, you know, pet some of all these people who have decided to repent, you know, and, you know, give them accommodation, give them homes and hope that they don't return to, you know, being terrorists again. Um, the fears that we'll, Nigerians would always state is, you know, how really possible is it that you don't, uh, that you change a person's ideology with regards to terrorism? Um, but it's also important to know the reason they became terrorists in the first place, if it was because of unemployment or because they believed in a particular, you know, um, um, Islamic ideology, um, extremist ideology. Um, so maybe the federal government has decided to use a carrot and stick approach, but at the same time, um, not, ex you know, be open about it to Nigerians. Um, the, one of the things that was stated in this report is about a particular person, a guy called Malamaliu, who was a former Boko Haram member and was part of the Bama massacre that killed, you know, hundreds or thousands um, of Nigerians in 2014. Um, he is one of the people who was mentioned here that is currently living rent-free and receiving stipends from the DSS, um, uh, for, you know, according to this program. Um, and um, the, the same way, to, not the same way, the, the pretty tough way to say this is maybe the Nigerian government has, you know, you know, a totally different approach from what the Nigerian people are expecting and they don't want to continue to use force. They want to see how they can also get intelligence from these people. Um, according to what the report says, you know, some of them are being recruited into the, the, um, uh, the DSS, Nigerian security agencies. Um, so, you know, to get information from them and whatnot. So, you know, there is also that approach, um, that is possible. Um, but, there's also those who totally would disagree with that narrative and say that, no, if you really want to stamp out terrorism, you need to do all that is necessary. And that is, you know, security wise to ensure that everybody who is found guilty, there is a terrorism act, there is, you know, the Criminal Justice Act, you know, any, anybody who is found guilty of associating or being, you know, a terrorist or, you know, assisting terrorist uh, should be, you know, be arrested and should have to go through, you know, the, the, whole, the, the law, face the law for their crimes against the Nigerian state and for, you know, all of that. You know, and also ask if the same treatment will be given to the, you know, ESN members and the, you know, Sunday Bowls, you know, followers and any other person who, you know, carries out atrocities against the Nigerian state. Um, and there's also the angles of, you know, what exactly has created the avenue for terrorism to thrive on that level in Nigeria. Right now, we're no longer talking so much about Boko Haram or ISWAP. We're now talking about banditry and kidnapping and the killings of people in different parts of the country. Um, what has created this avenue for that to thrive? You know, how is the federal government also addressing that? How are they sure that in the next five years there will not be a new group that, of course, wants to join, you know, the bandwagon? How are they addressing unemployment? How are they addressing the lack of schools in the north? How are they addressing poverty and hunger? How are they addressing those millions of Almagiri kids that are roaming around the streets in the north? And if you don't address all these things, then you're really only giving a temporary fix to, you know, the, the big problem. That really is it. And See, also, so let me just quickly add this, you know, the part where you also mentioned mm -hmm. that there is um, thousands of soldiers who are currently, you know, um, either amputated or have lost, you know, their, their lives completely. Their families who have, there are thousands of families who have suffered, you know, the, from the atrocities of these persons that are now being, you know, given a free house and, and the monthly stipends. Mm -hmm. And those people would never one day decide, okay, well, let's, uh, you know, agree with the carrot and stick, uh, stick approach. There are people who are still mourning today that, you know, there are people who, you know, probably lost their lives, you know, last week. So it, it, it would never just sit well with, you know, a large percentage of Nigerians. And I'm not sure how, how to explain it to them that some of the people who carried out those atrocities, who killed your family members, are now living rent free and enjoying a good life. Um, you're funded by the Nigerian government, according to the report. It would never make sense. Soldiers, family members, everybody. Totally, totally agree. So, as a student of international history and relations, I've got to understand how states behave, right? And when I look through the length and breadth of how governments in Nigeria react and approach things, I ask myself, what really is our national policy? What really is our foreign policy on certain issues? And that seems to be lacking. What is Nigeria's foreign policy? You won't even find that on Google because I don't think it exists in practice. I don't think we have. What is our national policy 
on terrorism. You would see Benue state to say no open grazing, Ondo state to say, oh, we agree. You would see um, Zamfara state to say, oh, we'll pay money to terrorists. Kaduna state will say we won't. Yes, it's good for state to have autonomy, but what's the national policy on issues where the government would, you would find, you know, bandits or rather students who were, who were abducted, released, and you'll hear sources from the family say they paid ransom. And another set of children will be abducted, and you'll hear the state government say they bombarded them and killed the terrorists. So what really is our national policy on dealing with terrorists? I don't think the we the have, federal government know. needs to tell us. Exactly. Because it seems like none exist. So we need to be able to find out and decide what really is the national policy of Nigeria on certain issues such as terrorism and security. Yeah. So we know how, exactly how we can move forward. Because it doesn't make sense when, you know, like you mentioned, um, some people come together to protest at the Lekki toll gates, you know, wherever, in Mokola Market, in Ibadan, wherever. And then the police clamp down on them, use tear gas, you converge at the Unity Fountain in Abuja, and they arrest you. But then you kill people in their numbers, and you get rent-free accommodation in a country like this where things are so expensive. You get, is it that estates are now being built for them to say, oh, when you repent, we'll just plug you into one of those houses, or they pay the rent? How, how really does it work? What's Nigeria's national policy on security? Um, makes absolutely no sense. Um, you know, I totally agree with you. Know, you know, with your narrative, there, there has to be a national policy that need, needs to be followed. Um, it cannot be, you know, good for the goose and not good good for exactly. the gander. You cannot treat people different. You cannot have different, you know, applications of the justice system um, depending on how you feel. I think there's also the influence of religion here, um, and you know, those who have also mentioned that, you know, the, the fact that. Um, the federal government may also be sympathetic based on, you know, the religions of these people, mm -hmm. you know, and if they were from a different tribe, you know, they might be, or different religion, they might be treated different. Um, so there's, a, there's numerous, you know, angles here and there um, that need to be looked at. But what's, you know, I totally agree that we need to have a national policy that cannot be different for every, you know, single, um, every single um, incident. It has to be followed. It has to be what the Nigerian government's stance is. Um, a thousand percent with regards to terrorism and threats to the Nigerian state. Indeed, and from security threats, we're moving over to threats in the health space. Um, let's take a listen to what um, Governor um, Song Wulu has to say about that. Lagos State is the epicenter of COVID-19 in Nigeria. The third wave has further put Lagos in the spotlight. The state governor reveals that the positivity rate of every 100 tests conducted currently stands at 12.1 percent, compared to 1.1 percent at the end of June 2021. At the end of July 2021, it was 7 percent. The last time we had this um, press conference, we were suspecting I was getting about 7, 7 percent then. Now it's about 12.1 percent from a 1.1 percent in June of 2021, meaning that for every 100 tests that we do, we get about 12 people that are infected. Governor Sawunlu attributes the trend seen in the third wave to non adherence to the health protocols designed to mitigate the pandemic. He reminds Lagosians of individual responsibility to fight and defeat the virus. He pleads with citizens to have themselves tested in any of the COVID-19 public test facilities and get vaccinated free of charge. We've received uh, just a little over 300,000 um, right now. And I'm happy to announce that from Wednesday on the 20, 25th, we'll start, we'll commence the vaccination um, at over 150 centers um, across the state. On inbound passengers, the governor discloses that since the commencement of isolation of passengers from red-listed countries, Lagos State's response has successfully quarantined 4,448 passengers. This figure was at 19th of August 2021. Also, 58 have been identified who tested positive to the virus despite a negative test on arrival. He warns that severe sanctions await anyone who flouts the protocol of the federal government and state COVID-19 pandemic laws. As at 21st yesterday, Lagos had identified over 5,998 persons and we have successfully um, isolated about 4,500 of them from the red-listed um, red countries, uh, meaning that 
Um, sadly, about a thousand people have also absconded. With a collective desire and joint efforts, we all can see the end of the virus. And it's confirmed we are in the third wave of the COVID-19 pandemic in the country. And here in Lagos, 135 persons have died. Originally, the report we heard was about 500, but um, the governor debunked that, saying, you know, um, what they have on the record is 135 persons who died due to the COVID-19 and the third wave. So positivity rates has increased to about 12%, but good thing um, vaccines are in Nigeria now, um, about 299,000 COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, vaccination exercise starting at August 26. So um, as the vaccines arrive, it's important for us to get vaccinated if you haven't. Yeah, um, you know, and continue to remind everyone that it's still out there and it's still very, very dangerous and it's probably even getting worse. It's more transmissible now, according to what they're saying. Um, you know, there's, you know, the, I, I think I read somewhere that the FDA in the United States is about to give approval to the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, vaccine. Um, you know, we're still expecting more vaccines here. I think Moderna was meant to be in already. Uh, we're, and and, uh, and uh, they're meant to also be, for those who haven't taken their second shots, you know, I'm expecting that there would still be more AstraZeneca vaccines sent to Nigeria for second shots uh, to be taken. Um, it's, it's getting more scary than, you know, than everyone had expected. You know, late 2020, a lot of people had thought, okay, maybe, you know, we'll probably, you know, it's probably the end. But apparently it's not. Um, will there be another lockdown in Lagos? Will the state be able to handle a, another lockdown? Is it necessary that we even shut down the state again? You know, and uh, you look at the economic concerns um, about that. But, you know, science, the economy, it's also, you know, very, very, very important. If you're not vaccinating as fast as possible and you don't see a lot of people adhering to COVID-19 rules, then you have to take drastic steps. 135 lives lost is, is no joke. You know, and I understand how, you know, we currently have that fatigue concerning COVID already. Um, the U.S. has lost almost 700,000 people and there's no other place. I mean, you cannot imagine 700,000 lives lost and, you know, nobody seems to even blink when you read that figure. Uh, so 135 in Lagos is scary. Um, whatever needs to be done, you know, those steps need to be taken now. I doubt that they would want to push for another lockdown because of how, you know, it will affect the state. But... Um, Nigeria needs to do what it can to vaccinate many, many, many more people to save lives. Um, these numbers you're seeing, I believe, according to what the you know, scientific um, you know, analysis uh, is out there, it is mostly because there's not been that many people vaccinated. Um, the whole of the country shared 3 point something million vaccines, 200 million people, which would never you know, even be enough. And so if we don't hit at least 70% vaccination um, rate, then... Um, we, we will continue to deal with this. It's just a reminder to Lagosians um, to be very, very careful. If you can stay at home, if offices need to at least um, make people work from home more often, please let that happen. You know, everyone who's still going clubbing and, you know, and living their lives like it's golden. I don't know how you guys have the guts to do that. <laughs> I personally move from office to home. And that's, that's basically, I live a, a very, very almost a triangular life. It's office home market, office home market. You know, and the market is, you know, pretty rare. So and once I get home, I'm not stepping out of my house again till I have to be back at the office. And I think everyone needs to try and at least protect themselves because there's still possibilities of people who are carriers of the, vi of the virus, but don't show their, you know, a, how do you call it, asymptomatic. Yes. So they don't show, you know, those signs. So whoever it is that you're interacting with that looks very, very healthy, um, may not, you know, be entirely healthy. Um, and people just need to be more careful. Definitely. And more updates on the COVID-19 pandemic and um, several other sectors in the country on Off the Press right after the break.